Christo Anestes. Christo Anestes. Let's say that together. Christo Anestes. That's Greek for Christ is risen. And certainly that is a greeting that we want to share today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. This morning, we're going to be talking about the events that took place on that first Easter morning. The pivotal point in all of history. Everything before this event was leading up to this moment. And everything beyond that event points back to it. Because it changes everything. Mark's telling of the story. It's thought to be the earliest of the four Gospels. So we're going to read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb. And they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Please be seated. So how does the gospel end? If indeed Mark is the first telling of the gospel message, does it ring out with hope and and, and courage? No, it, it leaves with some women who were fleeing the scene, trembling and bewildered. They say nothing. They're afraid. They're terrified of what they've just encountered. You know, if someone were making up this story about the most incredible event in in all of time leading up to this point or, or since, this is not how it would have ended. Certainly, it must be true. One of the unique aspects of Christianity compared with all other faiths in in movements, is that it traces its origin or its genesis to a single event on a single day. The the same can't be uh, said of, of Islam or Buddhism or Judaism or atheism. Overnight, you have a group of people that are completely sold out. Their, their lives change dramatically. And they're willing to to suffer persecution. They're willing to face martyrdom based on what they experience on this one day. Because this day changes everything. What did the people in the first century think about when you heard the word resurrection? You know, the human race has always wondered about what life is, is going to be like after you die from this life. And the prevailing view by a lot of people was that life was like a, a candle. And that as long as it was lit, so was your life. You know, like on Survivor, as long as your, your torch is going. But when it gets snuffed out, it, it's over. You remember the, the song from Elton John talking about Marilyn Monroe, that her life was like a candle in the wind, and it blew out. Because once it blows out, that, that's it. And so that was kind of the prevailing thought of the day. And there was an ancient tombstone epitaph that was found in both Latin and Greek that said this, I was not, I was, I am not, I don't care. It's not exactly a ray of sunshine, but that's it. But before now, I wasn't here, but now I am. But in a while, I'm not going to be, and I don't care. What we have in this life is it. Might as well live it to the fullest. And a lot of people are living their life in this reality today. This is it. Whether you have 50 years, 60, or 100, live it up. This is the life. You've got to grab everything you can out of this life because that's all that we have. 
Well, there were other people that believed in a place called Hades, this underworld where the, the departed souls and spirits go after death. And, and so these d- departed spirits would, would experience some shadowy existence, but they definitely would not come back to life. It was the Jews, it was the Hebrew people, people in Israel over time that believed a completely different uh, thing that would happen, that they called the resurrection. And it didn't just deal with our existence in the afterlife, because what they believed is that the problem wasn't going to be fixed with, with just an extended life. They believed that the world that we live in is a mess. And amen? Amen. This world is a mess. And they said, until this world gets fixed, what's the point of coming back into it? And so they believed that God, our Heavenly Father and Creator of this world, like the flood, will reset and will make a perfect world. He will fix the mess. And once He fixes it, the righteous will be brought back to life, and He will heal all creation in the process. So the resurrection was not just an afterlife, it was a better life. And they, they believed that it was a God-ordained life. It was a God-perfected per- life, a God-redeemed life, a God-set right life. And that's what they were looking forward to. That was their hope, that at the end of times, these things would happen. At the end of history, God would set up and establish justice. And they were an oppressed people living under the, the hand and the thumb of the Romans. They'd been sent off to Babylon, and, and all these different things had happened to them, and they wanted justice. They also believed in a time where suffering would end, that they would no longer be experiencing the current tribulations they were going under. They, they longed for a time when creation would be healed, and God would resurrect all of those that had fallen, especially those that had fallen in Him. That's what they were longing for. That's the resurrection that the Jews spoke up. If you remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about the story of Lazarus and his coming, when Jesus gets the word that his good friend Lazarus has passed away, he immediately returns back to Bethany. And it wasn't Mary that he encountered, it was Martha. I imagine she had her hand on her hips and she comes out and starts talking with Jesus and this wouldn't have happened if you had been here. And, and listen to his response. In John chapter 11 and verse 23, then listen to her response. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. He and Martha are on totally different wavelengths. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That was their only hope. That's what they were thinking about, that what's going to happen here is is just going to happen, and then we're going to have to wait for, for God to reset and rebuild this life that we're hoping for. But Jesus says, get ready. Because I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about right now. Tell him to come out. Remove the grave clothes. Here comes Lazarus. See, the Jews brought into this idea of a collective resurrection where all would be ushered into the age to come as a whole. But the whole idea of one individual coming up out of the grave totally was not on their radar screen and, and totally messed up their paradigm. That's not what they were hoping for. That's not what they were thinking about. It was out of the question. So here comes Jesus. And they, they believe he's a great teacher. They, they believe that he's teaching with authority like they've never heard before. They, they believe that he not only can teach about God, he talks about a relationship with God. Me and the Father are one. The, the, if you can see me, you can see the Father totally different than anything they had ever heard before. And so he's teaching in this way. He's talking about uh, ushering in a new kingdom. But there's going to be a twist. At, at the height of his popularity, Jesus died a cruel death on the Roman cross. And when this happened, even though he had predicted and said, this is what must happen, and this is what's going to happen after, no one thought, I mean, even those that were closest to him had said, all right. You guys just wait, because he said this is going to happen, and everything's going according to plan. We just kind of sit tight for a couple of days, and then everyone's going to go, wow. No, they, they were scared to death. When he was arrested, they fled. They deserted him. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned, and they were dispirited. 
The wind was taken out of them, and they fled for their lives. They figured that they were finished, and the disciples go into hiding. And then, suddenly, they weren't. All the people do a 180. That means they go halfway around. If I'm heading in this direction, I'm now going this way. And their lives change on a dime. They were completely convinced of the events that took place on that one day when Jesus was resurrected. And they were going to risk persecution and martyrdom to spread the news of the resurrected Christ. One day changed everything for them. Today, there are some people that are skeptical. Skeptical about the resurrection. Why? Well, because we're modern. We're, we're, we're modern, we're enlightened, we're smart. We have the benefit of, of knowing more stuff about how, how the cosmos work and, and, and science, and we have empirical evidence. We have all these different things. And, you know, in ancient times, I, I imagine people were a little superstitious. I imagine, you know, in, in certain ways they were gullible, and they might have been able to have someone pull something over their eyes. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Surprised by Joy, calls that chronological snobbery. He's saying that people back then were not dumb. They were not easily fooled. They understood what was happening, and they understood that dead creatures stay dead. John Ortberg, along with several other preachers, you may have heard this story. He shares a story about a woman who was cutting some vegetables at the sink, and she looks out the, the kitchen window, and she sees her German shepherd has something in his mouth, and upon further taking a look at it, turns out it's the neighbor's rabbit. And this German shepherd is just, just shaking this rabbit to death. And she's going, oh no, we have a terrible relationship with him. And this is definitely going to put him over the edge. So she flings out the back door, grabs the room, and starts wailing on the German shepherd. So he finally lets go of the slobbery rabbit who's now far gone. And so she goes, what do I do? So she panics, picks up the rabbit, looks around. No one has seen what's happening. She runs back inside. She gives the little bunny a bath, and she wipes off all the dirt and the slobber and everything else that was on this poor rabbit. And then she gets out a blow dryer, or a hair dryer, if you will, and, and, and starts blow drying this rabbit and makes his, his, his fur all fluffy and everything. The rabbit's looking good. And so she looks both ways, no one's there. She scampers back across into the yard, and she, she props up this bunny back in the cage. About an hour later, she hears her neighbor next door scream. And so she walks over, what's up? She goes, it's my bunny, our, our rabbit. He died two days ago. We buried him, and now he's back. What's happened? <laughs> the people in the ancient world knew that dead rabbits stayed dead. They also understood that dead rabbis stayed dead. N.T. Wright argues that there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. And this is what he writes. In not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of disappointed followers claiming their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. There were plenty of messiahs in the first century. And when they took their time of going before him and they were struck down, not a single group stood up and said, well, you just thought you put him to death. He's back alive. Not one. Because really, when it happened, when your guy got crucified by Rome, as Jesus did, he really only had one choice. Disband. We're following this guy. Now there's no one to follow. And so you say, guys, we had a good run at it. Man, wasn't that awesome? Remember we had, how many was it? Four or five? We had 5,000 we fed up. Oh, wasn't that great? All right, we'll see you guys later. And they disbanded. And that's what happened. That's what they did. They figured that they were done. They were toast. Well, two things happened that are revealed in Mark chapter 16 that we read at the beginning of service. First, the tomb was empty. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Believe me, if, if the Romans and the Jewish authorities could have produced a body, they would have. This was a nightmare. It was a political hot potato. Things were blowing them. If they had had a body, they would have produced it. But it says there was no body. 
The tomb was empty. That's what's going on here. And so the, the graves of heroes, especially of, of crucified messiahs, would be a place where, where they would come and venerate those that had fallen. All these graves, except this one, because this grave was empty. The second thing that happens is Jesus appeared to his fathers. He's going on ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. The Apostle Paul wrote 20 years later. It's not like this is just a couple months where they have men will collect a little bit of data. 20 years later, he said the risen Christ appeared to Peter. He appeared to the rest of the 12 in 500 of my fellow brothers in, 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 in Christ. And most of them are still alive. He couldn't say that 20 years later if there weren't a whole host of people that said, sign me up. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you about my experience. 500 willing to back him up. See, this is simply not a story that could have been made up because in a lot of ways it violated their understanding of what was going to happen in history. They had no idea that this is what God's plan was. Rousseau, the French skeptic, said this about the resurrection. Jewish authors would never have invented either that style nor that morality. And the gospel has marks of truth so great, so striking, so utterly imitable that the invention of it would be more astonishing than the hero. What he's saying in here is these guys couldn't have made this up. It's too far out there. This was not the ending that they expected, but it was the beginning that they experienced. Jesus is alive. I, I can't tell you. It, it's not something I was, I was thinking about. I put my finger right here. I, my, my hand went into his side. He let anyone that wanted to do that. It was him. I'm telling you, I experienced. He sat down and ate with us. I'm a witness. Totally sold out. Then they came to understand that it doesn't just end with Jesus. Because here was another twist that nobody was looking for. The age to come that they talked about, that they thought about what happened someday, started happening then. The world was different. The same power that raised Jesus from the tomb was the same power that they experienced and saw firsthand on the day of Pentecost. The church blows up, and their reality is totally different based on the events that took place on that day. And so you have this new resurrection community, people that are totally bought into the resurrection, that have seen it, that have experienced it, and know God is up to something incredible. When Jesus rose again and took those steps across the threshold of the tomb, life changed it's a new reality you can't go back to the old way of looking at life you have to realize god is up to something incredible the new work has begun a new day is dawn and we're not going back we want to experience what god has shown us through this resurrection of jesus because death no longer has a sting and, and sin no longer holds a sway over my life. I know there's power, power to resurrect my life, to live in a different, in, in a different way because one day changed everything. What about us? Here's where it gets personal. There's one more step that needs to be taken, a step of belief for you. And I, I, I want to believe. I, I just wish I could have been one of those 500. I, I wish I could have been. I mean, I, I, I kind of believe, but I wish I could have been one of those 500. Let's, let's imagine something for just a moment. I like to do interviews. Imagine that. Put someone in your mind, maybe a famous celebrity that you kind of follow or something has passed away in the next the, the past few years. I, I picked out four. Here's the four that I picked out. If you don't like these, pick someone else. But we got, we got Heath Ledger. Uh, we have uh, Elizabeth Taylor. 
we have Whitney Houston and Dale Earnhardt. We are in the southeast after a while. You know, okay, so if you don't like one of these, pick someone else. Now imagine I haven't told the congregation. One of these people has come back. They're all dead. Imagine one of these has come back from the life beyond. And, and it showed up at our house. I said, well, we're going to keep you under wraps. Stay down in my office until it's time. Then I'll have someone escort you up through the, the lobby, and they're going to come through that door. Imagine them walking up. And at first, as, as they walk through and come up onto stage, first thing you think is, well, it's an impersonator, or it's a lookalike. And then you start looking, taking a second look. You know some mannerisms. You listen to their voice. You see it in their eyes, <laughs> violet eyes, if you're Elizabeth Taylor. You're like, oh, no one else has eyes like that. You know it's that person. I start asking them questions. Tell us what happens once you go from this life to the next. Tell us about the realities that you've experienced. And so they, they start telling, saying, everything you've heard, it pales in comparison. You, you've heard stories about a, a great light and everything, you, about, about vivid colors. Those are just visions. I've experienced the reality. And everything that you've heard about Jesus is true and more. I, I've met the saints. I, I've been in the presence of God. And really, I don't want to talk about anything else except the presence of God. And, and seeing his glory is incredible. And maybe one of these guys also talks about the reality of hell. He said, you have no idea. There, there, there's no way to describe that reality. There, there, there's no way for me to put in, in, into words uh, something that, that describes that pain and that suffering and that separation from all this good and the separation from Christ. I can't imagine being separated from him for all of eternity. They start sharing these things. And our jaw just drops. What would happen if that person were sitting here in that chair and gave that testimony? What would that look like in our lives? Would your life change? I mean, if you, if you, if you experience it, you know for sure it's a dead person has come back to life. Would you quit your job? Would you move to Jerusalem? I mean, the closest place I, to God, uh, where, where am I going to go? You know, do you start telling people of your celebrity experience. No, I, I'm serious. Whitney Houston was at our church. We let her sing the final song. She did Amazing Grace. There wasn't a dry eye in, in the place. I promise, I know her voice. It was her. W would you tell people about it? Absolutely. Would you sell your possessions to get the word out? Would you risk imprisonment, even death, to let people know? Of course, because there's nothing in this life that would matter. Exactly. That's what happened in Acts. The people that had experienced this one day, life totally changed. A lot of them stayed there in Jerusalem, started the church. They gave up everything. They gave up families, gave up possessions. They sold fields. They lived in, in community with one another. They risked everything to get the message out because they had experienced the reality of the empty tomb. They knew what it was like until you embrace the empty tomb. The story of Jesus is not going to change you. It takes time to take a step. This morning I'm calling us to a step, and it's kind of a two-part step, so if you want to call it two steps, that's fine. The first is we have to believe in the reality of the resurrected Christ. We have to believe in that. For those that lived in, in the time of Christ and witnessed these deeds, they sacrificed all to spread the word. There was nothing lukewarm about the witnesses that saw Jesus on the other side of the grave. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal said, I prefer to believe those writers who get their throats cut for what they write. Every single one of the New Testament writers save John, experienced much worse than having their throat cut. There was no recounting. You can't go back on a story that means everything for you. They all joined to become part of the resurrection community. John Piper says this of the impact of the resurrection. 
when you know the truth about what happens to you after you die, and you believe it, you are satisfied with all God will be for you in the ages to come, that truth makes you free indeed. Free from the short, shallow, suicidal pleasures of sin and free for the sacrifices of mission and ministry that causes people to give glory to our Father in heaven. As a resurrection community gathered here at Twickenham, may we help those that are lost to find their way. May we help those that are sick to find healing. May we help those that are lonely to find belonging. May we help those that are troubled to find peace. That's what the resurrection community is beginning a new way, walking in a different light based on the reality of what we believe. Can I get real for just a moment? If your life is not sold out to the ministry of Christ or the mission of God, you don't fully believe in the reality of the empty tomb. Because when you do, this life we hold in such high regard and the life to come, we just don't. When you understand the resurrection of Christ, you understand the temporary nature of this life. This life means nothing. It's a mist. It's a vapor. We're longing for the life to come, and our life reflects that. All of our resources, all of who we are, our time is consumed with the ministry of Christ, modeling who Jesus is to the world around us to say it's authentic based on how I'm living. And the mission, we have to see ourselves on mission, that our whole existence is bringing and reconciling and participating in that reconciling mission of God to bring people to him in order that they may be saved, not for this life, but for the life for all of eternity. That's what we're called to believe in, believe in the empty tomb, because that day changes everything. Well, have you taken that step th this morning? Boy, what a great day it would be to do that. Our shepherds will be available after services if you'd like to, to talk with them, have them pray with you. Certainly the staff's available throughout the week. Come have lunch. We'd, we'd love to, to start a conversation with you about where you are spiritually and where you would like to be based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And certainly if you'd like to give your life over to the Lord, Bars of Baptistry are always available. We'll do that th this afternoon. We'll do it tonight at 2 in the morning. We'll do it next week. Whenever you'd like to, give your life over to Jesus Christ because we want that day to be the one day that changes your everything. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are a faithful God. You are the God who raised Jesus from the dead. We remember and rejoice in and celebrate that most glorious day, would you bring that same power into our lives, the lives of the men and women and young people gathered here this morning. May we give ourselves over to the resurrection community and join in the proclaiming of the empty tomb. Lord, may our lives be the proof of your love demonstrated on the cross. And may our lives be the proof of the power displayed at the tomb. We give you our love, we give you our praise. We thank you for our hope. We do this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us this morning, and I hope that you've been blessed by being here as we have shared once again the great message, He is risen.